Uh, one, one quick announcement. We've found a room key for room 411. If you don't claim it, I'm going to go steal all your shit. So. <laughs> okay. But I'm not there anymore. We're going to throw this in the basket. If anybody wants to go steal Andre's shit. <laughs> That's what he said. Okay. All right. It's, it's my great pleasure to, uh, to bring up Greg Jay from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, we together? All right. Uh, I'd like to bring up Greg Jay from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee to introduce our final plenary speaker today, Michael Gillespie. So. Welcome back. <laughs> I don't think we see any more stragglers. Good. Well, it is an honor to introduce Michael Boyce Gillespie. Uh, Michael describes his research interests as black visual and expressive culture, film theory, visual historiography, global cinema, adaptation studies, popular music studies, and contemporary art. But if you've followed Michael or have seen his CV, you know that that's just a little bit of what he does. I'm proud to say that uh, Michael got a BA in English. Uh, told me I could do anything with it. There you go. <laughs> uh, a BA at Morehouse College. So I'm hoping that if there are any questions about um, Beyonce and homecoming, um, and about the performance at Coachella, we could ask you, too, about or, that. Or not. Or not. <laughs> Have you been following any of that? Uh, no. Oh, well, you need, you need to go on and, and listen to, uh, to Wesley Morris and Jenna Wortham on uh, in processing, and you'll, you'll find it all. All right, back to, back to the introduction, and we know that Michael is uh, currently at, um, well, let's go through. He began his career at Ohio University has taught at uh, NYU, Princeton, the Graduate Center at CUNY, and is now um, at City College of New York as an associate professor with joint appointment in media communication and in the Black Studies program. His recent book, which I meant to bring up here with me, but which is sitting, do they have it out there? Yeah. The book? Yeah. All right, everybody, get your copies. Film Blackness, American Cinema, and the Idea of Black Film. And here we have the ampersand, again, everybody using film and cinema together. Uh, frames black film alongside literature, music, art, photography, new media, treating it as an interdisciplinary form that enacts black visual culture, black visual and expressive culture. Writing in Choice Magazine, G.A. Foster says about the book, this astonishingly comprehensive compact book does nothing less than synthesize nearly the entirety of thought to date on black cinema, blackness in the cinema, and scholarship in this vital area of film studies, which is quite an endorsement. So. Okay, <laughs> congratulations. His essays have appeared in Film Quarterly, in the Journal of the Association for the Study of the Present, uh, Black Camera, and elsewhere. It's been featured on programs in many, many conferences around the, the country and um, in Canada. Uh, his articles and essays have appeared in many edited collections. He's been active, too, in organizations and in the curation of programming in the study of blackness film, and media. He's on the advisory board for the Academy Muse, uh, Museum of Motion Picture Art and Sciences ex exhibition on regeneration, black cinema, 1900 to 1970. Has been a programmer and moderator for Cinema Today, Film Blackness at Princeton. His teaching includes cinema studies, the art of film, there's the ampersand again, uh, world cinema, Spike Lee, Chester Himes, right on, and the noir tradition, hip hop cinema, blackness and the arts, Japanese new wave cinema, visual historiographies, and he's on the editorial boards for social text and cinema journal. I have no idea what he does in all this spare time. I give you Michael. <laughs>
Thank you so much for that introduction. You really must come to my wake and speak. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, to begin with, I'd really like to thank Richard and Jocelyn for uh, the, the invitation. And such a shout out to Molly and EJ and Kyle and all the everyone else in terms of the student support of the event. Um, I am slightly disappointed with the, uh, the, the conference. Uh, I had expected a hologram of Susan Sontag reading <laughs> Decay of Cinema. Um, and I'm a little pissed, but I'll, I'll move on. Um, but, but it's, <laughs> I, I actually reread uh, Decay of Cinema last night. And that's because I started graduate school at NYU in the fall of 95. And that piece came out in February of 96. And we spent a lot of time laughing. Um, but in <laughs> retrospect, as I, looking at the piece last night, uh, just kind of appreciating that she's precisely talking about a death, that a, a, uh, an end in death of uh, her, her understanding of cinephilia in that moment, which now I find myself much more forgiving about. Um, I was also kind of thinking about the many times that I've heard the end of cinema evoked. And I began to think about my own first time. You never forget your first end. Um, and for me, that was uh, my initial work as a graduate student, believing I was going to write a dissertation on the Japanese new wave cinema. And that very crucial end in that 60s period uh, is something that's uh, kind of crossed over and informed my appreciation for politics and aesthetics and culture. So the image, if you're not familiar with it, this is one of the attendants that was a part of uh, Kara Walker's subtlety. You might remember the Mammy Sphinx a couple of years back in the former Domino's fact uh, Sugar Factory. Um, walking through the space, I became very fixated on these figures. Um, now, if you have not been reading in the New York Times, there are great ads about the condos that are now opening up in that space. And I've begun to fantasize that something like poltergeist, that these <laughs> attendants will rise from the earth and choke those yuppie bastards. But, <laughs> um, but let me, you know, I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about more generally what I'm interested in in terms of thinking about what my investment is in an end of cinema. And that's by way of kind of a pivot of thinking about the importance of these four films to my own work. Uh, these were the films that constituted my objects in my book, Film Blackness, uh, American Cinema and the Idea of Black Film. Each of them was quite crucial in testing my investment in cinema studies and testing um, myself in terms of what I wanted to say and think about the idea of black film. Um, Ralph Bakshi's Coonskin, a, uh, it's a film for me which uh, represented all things great about Mikhail Bakhtin and the racial grotesque, particularly thinking through how Bakshi's initial idea of simply doing a black exploitation version of Disney's Song in the South actually quite crucially becomes an indictment of a kind of history of American popular culture. Uh, Chameleon Street, a film that won the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance the year after uh, Steven Soderbergh's Sex, Lies, and Videotape seemingly put American independent film in the map, but more honestly showed the studios that um, uh, American independent film could make money. <laughs> uh, it's a film that, for me, is important because of the multiple failures it was subjected to. It was thought of as uh, a failed art film, a failed independent film, film, a failed black film, and even a failed American film. And for me, its failure fails us all. Uh, then there is uh, Deep Cover, Bill Duke's Deep Cover, which for me is the unrealized Chester Himes adaptation that I've always wanted since I'm deeply dissatisfied with every Chester Hines adaptation that's been done. Uh, and then finally, Medicine for Melancholy, uh, Barry Jenkins' first feature film. It's a film that he made after graduating from the University of Florida Film School and spent a year working at, within Oprah's Harpo. He was working in Harpo industry. He had a revelation after a year of working in Harpo of 
am I even a filmmaker anymore? So he makes this film on $18,000 in the course of 10 to 18 days. Um, it's a film that for me was important in terms of really dialing in what I wanted to say about black film, um, especially after its opening in New York and a student came to me and said, Professor Gillespie, I saw Medicine for Melancholy, I think you should go see it, and I said, why? And he goes, well, it, it's, it actually asks the question, it answers the question of how do you make a, mumble, a good mumblecore film? <laughs> and, and I said, really? How do you make a good mumblecore film? <laughs> and he said, well, you actually introduce issues of race. Okay. So for me, this kind of film blackness project that I've been on this, this path, this journey, it was about kind of less about black film, but more precisely about the idea of black film and the ways that black film may be thought of as operating as a kind of visual negotiation, if not tension, between film as art and race as a constitutive cultural fiction. I've constantly been pushing, deliberately trying to engender a shift to distinguish between the rendering of race in the arts from the social categories of race. And this shift is about disputing the fidelity considerations of black film, this presumption that the primary function of this brand of American cinema entails some kind of extra diegetic responsibility or capacity to embody the black life world or provide answers in the sense of social problem solving. Black film, for me, must be understood as art, not prescription, and this has everything to do with my sense of my own black cinephilia which also has a lot to do with the fact that I adore film, but I don't trust it. Uh, furthermore, for me, the idea of black film cannot be tantamount to an ethics of positive and negative representation that insists on black film in the terms of cultural policy or in a category, genre, or mimetic cooperation of the black experience. So that's where all of this began. And this is where I am now. So when, the book became, so when the book came out, uh, when my book came out in 2016, uh, and I began to think about what my next project would be, um, I realized that I was drawing more and more focus on a very particular cluster of short films. Most were experimental or avant-garde pieces, and all of them shared a focus on black death. This also became compounded by reading Christina Sharp's In the Wake, Blackness and Being. I started thinking about film form and black death to build on my initial <laughs> film blackness proposition as a way to become more invested in thinking about fundamentally an insistence on form over content. So most of the work that I've been doing the last year has been devoted to kind of writing these critical and creative pieces uh, a bit of critical memory pieces, and a bit of fiction. So in the spirit of what's been a fabulous conference, I wanna, I'm going to talk a bit about the, this current work and also screen two short films for you. Okay? So some of the questions to kind of keep in mind that I'm still continuously wrestling with and thinking through. Uh, issues around the antinomies of the archive, uh, the dichotomy of social death and black death. Um, also trying to think about what are the stakes of this current iteration of a death analytic, and also questions of silences, bio-death, and image life. So, you see here from Christina Sharp's In the Wake, I share her call. I'm interested in ways of seeing and imagining responses to terror in the very in various ways that our black lives are lived under occupation, ways that attest to the modalities of black life lived in, as, under, and despite black death. So Christina Sharp's conception of wake work concentrates on how visual and expressive culture renders and contemplates death in the afterlife of slavery in black life. Her assessment of existence in the wake attends to the structural and affective with reference to a range of connotations, including, quote, the keeping watch with the dead, the path of the ship, a consequence of something, and the line of flight and or sight, awakening and consciousness, end quote. 
She mobilizes new investments for the study of black death and the art of blackness, with particular attention to how this art, how the arts begin to propose some way of mediating this state of unsurvival. So mediation in this, in the, it's, mediation is important for me in the place of strict notion of art as embodiment of experience, because it becomes a key strategy for my disquisitions on death in contemporary black film and video. Sharp's work vitally suggests a shift of emphasis from strictly the portrayal of horror to a concentration on how cinema enacts a critical and aesthetic <coughs> resistance to the horror of anti-blackness. So of course, black death in contemporary cinema requires understanding how film blackness always means provoking new measures of the aesthetic, political, social, and cultural capacities of black visual and expressive culture. And as a result, the critical consequence of film blackness always entails issues of affect, narrativity, visual historiography, and genre slash modalities. In this way, black death for me always signifies both the violent injustice surrounding African American murders and the rendering of death in cinema. So the films I'm going to be screening today and discussing uh, today represent an ever-growing archive of recent works that merit critical attention as they advance cinematic principles that point to new political philosophies and circuits of knowledge related to black death and film form. These films do more than show, they devise. So in this way, kind of pivoting from and being inspired by, I'm tentatively working within this rubric uh, a la Christina Sharp of cinema in the wake, as a way of posing, as a way of addressing the ways that these new cluster of films pose a range of formal propositions and critical interventions about black death. So my, uh, my end of cinema trajectory, therefore, is an insistence on how black film must remain vitally, irrecon uh, vital uh, vitally irreconcilable in generative discursive practice, and of course, the anti-black violence of the state. So the first film I want to show you is Jatavia Gary's An Ecstatic. So I'd like to begin with a quote from Jatavia Gary herself. Um, I'm simultaneously creating and destroying, remaking and unmaking my intimate interaction with the archive, expresses my desire to be a part of it, to make my presence felt in and on that history while also interrogating it. That which is beautiful and holy and entanglement. Jatavia Gary's an ecstatic experience derives its title and arguably it's enraptured spur from Kathleen Collins' 1982 film, Losing Ground. Ecstatic experience is the research interest of Collins' philosophy professor protagonist, Sarah Rogers. Rogers works to conceive of ecstasy in ways more attendant to the artist's practice than to the strict terms of Christian doctrines. She must also manage the new ecstatic experiences developing in her life. As the character comments, quote, if ecstasy is an immediate apprehension of the divine, then the divine is energy, end quote. The energy of an ecstatic experience in total is a churning of performativities, affective economies, and temporalities. Black matter, a holy, syncretic revolution. The film opens with found footage of Sunday morning people, black folk moving to and through glory. They come for his lesson. As the cross atop the church steeple makes plain, he is alive again. With the scenes of the lost and found parishioners arriving suited and crowned, the rumors of an ethnographic ramble to come shift to something more. The animation and score together refabulates and recomposes these parishioners. This is call and response with an image and the capacity to sketch and conjure. Gary's hand processing of the film stock, her direct animation process, proffers a range of colors and shapes that regulate the worship beneath the frame. Antibodies in motion, escalation, modulation, an anointing gesture. The animation on the film surface recodes the image of folks fanning in the heat, children sleeping, the preacher man preaching. I'm just a vessel. They are folk fighting to keep the devil from stealing their joy. 
It is the score of this section that is deeply, deeply vital. Alice Coltrane's journey to Satchitananda compounds the transmogrification of their faith. The title cut from the 1971 album of the same name, the song begins with Cecil McBee's bass, a beat, a foundational pulse, a point of origin. And then Tulsi's tambura and Alice Coltrane's harp forge a harmonic counterpoint of strings that build texture and timbre along with the accents of Rashid Ali's drums. This building is the orchestration of a negotiation between the concussive and the vibrational, a shaping stir of resonance and direction as the music settles into the stratospheric melodies of a ragged swirl when Pharaoh Sanders arrives in soprano sax. The consecration is complete, transcendental sounded. A sonic mapping of a new gospel that is amply boosted with harmonics that resonate as a call to conversion and ascension a praise song and the black experimental idiom of jazz. Our text for today is the word and jazz collectivity. Satchitananda, ultimate. Satchitananda, truth. The rise of the spirit in rapture cuts the second section of an ecstatic experience. Ruby D on a television stage performing a slave. This is the slavery episode from the History of Negro People series broadcast on NET from 1965. Ruby Dee is a woman reminiscing about her mother's refusal to be a slave. She remembers her mother working in the field. She remembers her mother stopping and shouting, someday we ain't going to be slaves no more. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. A black body at rest is a conspiratorial act. She caught the spirit and for that she caught cowhide lashes. Before suicide by cop, was there suicide by overseer? Ruby Dee is reading an Ozzie Davis penned adaptation of an account given by Fanny Moore, a woman born a slave in South Carolina in 1849. Miss Moore gave this account in 1937 at the age of 88 as part of the WPA's Federal Writers Slave Narrative Project. During Dee's monologue, Gary's animating hand on the surface again engineers the diegesis beneath, the love below. Remediation. Again, the animation stipulates measures of process and energy, trembling, cellular, mitochondrial, animated shape fury, the shape of things to come. Ruby D meets mitosis, her image divides, framed by cubes and triangles. She is crowned, scarred, erased, but she and her voice persist. Speckled and haloed, unbowed and sainted, transmogrification, radiation ruling the nation, black matter, two trains running, two freedoms channeling, two temporality scripts, rebel slave, and civil rights celebrity. An ecstatic experience then cuts to a video of Asata Shakur speaking in 1987 from Cuba in an interview with Gil Noble from his long-running program, Like It Is. Asata Shakur, member of the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Movement, a revolutionary, convicted of murder in 1977, yet escaped from the Jersey chain gang in 1979. I decided it was time. Political asylum in Cuba since 1984, a $1 million reward, highest bounty on a runaway slave ever. From the Deliver Us or From Evil Revival at the film start, to the Fannie Moore Ruby D lenticular testimony of refusal, to the free exile option of Shakur, an ecstatic experience closes on footage of Baltimore and a state of insurrection following the murder of Freddie Gray. Black Lives Matter, you think? The film's art closes on a protest riot revolution triggered by the quotidian shenanigans <coughs> of Black Death. Gary's hand continues the treatment of the celluloid as fabric, a material dyed and cast. Her animation continues to stir as an instrument for improvisational intenting historiographics, a kind of chronopoetics, haptic texturing, scalar intimacies. In this, the film's final act, the Baltimore footage is intercut with the choral performance of Voices Incorporated, the group that stood on a riser behind Ruby D during the slavery bro broadcast. As they sang the battle hymn of the Republic, the rapid intercutting produces a flicker effect the song evenly, even, evenly bleeds between two spatiotemporalities. 
Flicker is neural inscription, affective acceleration, escape velocity. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. Gary's material process of animation is a theorizing of blackness. And of course, with Christina Sharp in mind, the animation operates as material disturbances on the film's surface. This is what Sharp has called weight work, work that reconfigures and considers black precarity in a manner that can attest to the modalities of black death. Gary renders film blackness as cinema in the wake, an assemblage of work that, as I've said, poses new circuits and aesthetic accountings of blackness, sociality, and obliteration. Arcane and prodigious, an ecstatic experience deregulates the American archive, compromising it with the mapping, state, mapping of states of freedom and strategies of resistance. Dead reckoning, liberation cartography. Be anointed, be still, escape, exile, resist, live, fuck it, get free. A black woman's hand. So the next film is something, so you can actually see the title. All right, so this is a recent work by Jatavia. She just finished this last year. It's a part of a, at this point it could be a, it's a short video shot in the summer of 2016 during Jatavia Gary's residency in of La Vie en Rose plays throughout. The film archives and indexes, as in total, it is comprised of the following images. The G. Rene Gardens, archival footage, images of Flora from the gardens affixed to the film stock and projected, Gary posing and moving through the gardens, animation sequences, and Diamond Reynolds' Facebook Live footage of her boyfriend, Philando Castile, dying, wounded by five bullets. Two pierced his heart. The film's editing structure suggests the prosaic coding of an essay film. Moreover, the film's tableau is deeply compromised, conflicted by patches of glitches, rectangles, squares, precise pockets and zones that destabilize the pastoral, rendering, as it, a rendering it as a deliberate patchwork of codes and conceits. The glitches unsettle the patchwork as crash points, deceleration spots, and disintegration loops. These breaches are the affective textures that stress the surface of the image and expose an unstable beneath. Hold me close and hold me fast. This magic spell you cast, this is La Vie en Rose. The archival element of the film includes footage of Monet painting in his gardens from 1915 and Fred Hampton from 1969. One is a record of mastery and the other of revolutionary consciousness. Along with Diamond Reynolds' video and Gary's record of her own presence in the gardens, there are thus four visual historiographies that the film negotiates in meters. The pitching down of Louis Armstrong's voice thrives above the opiate of pathology scripts that are usually associated with chopped and screwed by operating as a kind of sonic grounding of this gathering. In this way, the chopped and screwed signature of Satchmo accents the song's measure of love, breaking from the specificity of more classical mixes and arrangements of the song. With this remix, the song's protagonist no longer inhabits the place of the lovelorn source a black and blue B-side concentration. Satchmo is grieving as the song now <coughs> acts as a, dirge, as a dirge pitched with the new ordinance, ordinance of black death. Gary does not feature any of the footage of Castile. Instead, his death becomes rearticulated through a blocking shift in perspective. The footage of the dying Castile is cropped away as off-screen space that results in the amplification of another spectacle and focal point. Diamond Reynolds and her despaired commentary. When I asked Jatavia about this, this is what she said. Quote, I opted to not use the bloody body of Philando Castile. I just can't view that footage. To this day, I still haven't watched the video in its entirety. I'm enraged, saddened, and disruptive in the worst way possible, and have no desire to incorporate the violent deaths of black people in my art. My work is ancestral. I'm not sure I'm honoring the ancestors by reproducing violent deaths." End quote. Black death virality, a lynching souvenir, a finger, a toe, an ear, testicles, and a video stream. Hold me close and hold me fast. This magic spell you cast, 
This is La Vie en Rose. What happens when you suspend the never neutral visual spectacle, the evidentiary record that at no time in American history has ever guaranteed justice? As a remediation of a death scene, Reynolds witnessing sees and calls out the systemic claims that enabled her boyfriend's murder. She, great, she grieves for one who was grievable. The Facebook Live video is an act of dark surveillance as Reynolds observes and reveals the anti-black surveillance force of the state. Her real-time accounting commands something very particular of the spectator. As Julie Beth Napoling writes, quote, when Reynolds narrated what was happening in the car at that moment, an alternate, an alternate and urgent relation is demanded by the narrating voice, neither projection nor identification, but recognition, end quote. A broken taillight, a notification to the officer that a weapon was present in the car, deliberate and non-aggressive movements, and the conclusion of black death. We don't deserve this, she said, recognition. Do you fucking see this? Gary strolls, smokes, and then she is nude, and then she screams. She holds a direct address that roots her place in this garden, in this palette, and in this world. I'm standing here thinking it's not about you. This is a fugitivity bloom for all the world to see. She screams. She screams in a garden, a system not broken, but very much at work. The film does not claim that this is not a time for flowers. Instead, the piece is a beautiful and devastating musing on why not all will have a place in this garden. Her scream is not strictly about mourning. Perhaps it is a cry of love, or maybe about the capacity to imagine what happens when black folks stop being nice. Hold me close and hold me fast, this magic spell you cast. This is La Vie en Rose. So I'm out of time, but I implore you, if you care about the idea of black film, to revisit the ways that perhaps the last 10 years has produced some of the most exquisite and complicated work imaginable. I implore you to listen and to the breaths and the rises and consider what it means when everything and nothing is revealed. This is the task, this is the urgency. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Michael. I think that was such a wonderful exploration of what so much of this weekend has been about, which is cinema and scholarship as an archive of both mourning and vitality. So it was beautiful. All right, we have about 20 minutes for questions, so. Yeah, I, I, I first just kind of want to bring this to Milwaukee. I'm from Milwaukee, and uh, I just want to, uh, um, you know, you'll forgive me. Um, but but uh, today there's two really important things going on in Milwaukee. Last night we were driving around, and one of our Brazilian friends said, uh, "Why are the why is the flag at half mast?" Well, I, I looked into that. I didn't know, but the flag's in half mast today because of the funeral of the great Bell Phillips. Bell uh, uh, just passed away, a uh, lifetime of uh, uh, activism, one of the first Ameri African American uh, legislators. And so we uh, mourn her passing, but her incredibly productive and powerful and politically important life. The other uh, is today has been um, kind of defined among the grassroots people in Milwaukee as Dantre Day. Uh, though it is Cinco de Mayo as well, but uh, Dantre Day, Dantre Hamilton was killed uh, by police over at Starbucks down in Red Arrow Park, and the uh, a few years since then has, has seen a, a great rise of uh, intersectional resistance within Milwaukee. So uh, uh, forgive me for that, but it, that just seems incredibly significant with where we are and what we just saw. And I thank you for that beautiful, uh, beautiful presentation. Um, my question uh, is, I, I, I really am truly interested in the collectivity that you mentioned. Um, so if you could talk about the kind of collectivity of productions, what that means in terms of authorship and in terms of movement building and community building. 
thanks for the question. Uh, so what, you know, particularly in terms of the group that Jatavia is with, it's on some of the most basic levels. It's about having, uh, you know, regular meetings where people are screening their work, uh, being able to collectively give one another critiques. Uh, the New Negress Film Society, if you go to their website, you have the opportunity to arrange to have them uh, present as a group. They do really wonderful screening programs where they mix all of their work together. Um, I mean, what's, what, what's become very important for me, you know, you know, why I'm more interested in kind of the more experimental and avant-garde medium is to uh, kind of not cap the kind of, or to put a cap on the kind of expectations that one can have of this work. Um, but, you know, the, in the case of the New Negress Film Society, they're very much, they're five filmmakers who are working together. If you look at the group, The Black Aesthetic, which is based out of Oakland, this is a group that began just by screening, putting up their own screening series to explore the idea of the black aesthetic. Uh, it's primarily made up of graduate students and freelancers and artists. Um, they put out two books. They're about to start their third season this fall. Uh, what I've been pretty fascinated with with the kind of work that they're doing is uh, the ways they've kind of moved around to, they were initially did programs at this independent <coughs> bookstore in Oakland and now they've basically moved all around in that way. Um, for me, collectivity in this current moment of the kind of clusters that I'm looking at is so important because it's really an opportunity to see uh, artists thinking together. Uh, there, there is no kind of definitive aesthetic that they're working with. I think that Jatavia's work is probably uh, one of the, some of the most more, a more abstract work of the, of the um, New Negroes Film Society. I like the kind of open-endedness of their practice. And I particularly like the way that it, it circulates in a very uh, generative way. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michael. That was a really um, brilliant and powerful talk. Um, I, I'm really interested in the way you're theorizing and articulating the idea of black film. And I wanted to ask you about how globally you're thinking about the concept. Like I know for Christina Sharp, yeah. you know, wake work, it, it you know at least crosses the transatlantic. And right. Actually, she does have a very global concept of blackness. Right. And I'm wondering to what extent you're positioning your idea of black film um, in relation to African American cinema, mm -hmm. um, you know, and African American culture and history, and how just kind of like uh, how much it goes beyond the nation state, how geographically expensive it is. Right, right. Um, so thank you for the question. And, and um, for me, that's the next step of the work they've done. I mean, that was one of the things that I had to be very precise about with, the, with uh, the book was that I was primarily uh, invest, er, er, focusing on uh, an American context. For me, it's again, uh, in, uh, reading, it's, it's, it's been this slow, but actually kind of a fun process of trying to track down film festivals that are happening around the world. You find out what films are on their program. Maybe you get excited by a description of the film. And you know, every freaking artist has a Vimeo code that they're able to secretly share with you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's been about going, you know, putting together this. So organizationally, I, the, I would, the future of this project is to think about uh, a more global sense, but there's, I know that there's such a specificity in the work that I'm doing and looking at the American context that uh, I don't know how global my work could actually be. But I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not disallowing the possibility, let's say, that the way that I talk about film blackness might not inspire someone who's looking at, uh, you know, cinemas arising all over the world. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a process for me and it's a process that I'm open to. Um, yeah, thank you, Michael. It was really a delight to hear some of the background to this yes. yesterday in the Unwatchable Panel and kind of then to see the rest and see the films. Um, I was struck by, I think you described the space of the gardens as like carefully designed um, and put together. It strikes me that it's also a preserved space, right? right? That it's, and it's this 
much different mode of preservation than when we talk about film, right? And, um, and I'm wondering, I don't know if you could talk a little bit about how, I think one of the things that's come up over and over again is this kind of sense of um, displacement or disorientation or rearrangement that film enables by kind of um, rearranging time and the way in which, um, you know, I think you read the, the quote from um, Nicole Fleetwood about the, about the black body in this space, but it's also a sort of temporal collision, right, of the contemporary body in this historically preserved space. And, and I'm curious about that. Um, these different kind of approaches to preservation that come out in the film. Yeah, Thank, thanks for the question. Um, so that's, uh, that's the next step. I mean, you know, my next book project is, it's, it's the working title is Death Grips, and it will basically be uh, going through this cluster of like 10 to 15 films that I've been writing these short pieces on and, and actually trying to find a um, a different way of writing on them, I think, as you heard. Um, so just to kind of give you, the, the, the use of, the, of, of Nicole's work was important for me because Nicole is talking about uh, Renee Cox's engagement with the, the, uh, the canon. Um, I like, you know, I, there's, there's a section of this that I, it's still getting worked out because I'm, I'm very much interested in how there is a um, verifiably, um, a celebratory measure of death in terms of preservation around the fact of you know the, the timelessness of Monet, and and I like the the ways in which Gary is introducing uh, a, a much uh, more consequential measure of death and contra contradistinction of that, which I think produces the kind of a, a healthy contamination of that space, and uh, and the ways that preservation can sometimes operate uh, as a kind of um, restriction. You know, particularly in terms of, uh, and I'm thinking of this as well of of, of um, preservation in terms of you know my own experience in cinema studies. You know, of this idea <laughs> of of these sanctified ways of that people will refuse to engage with, say, work like this. You know, like someone will say to me, you know, uh, I'm not black, so I'm not really comfortable teaching black film. And it's like, well, shit, you're not Soviet, but you can be, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're not German, you're not Italian, you're not French, and you're comfortable with that shit, so get off your ass and do the work. You know? So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to follow that, man. <laughs> I mean, I wish I could use that shit in class, like, yeah. I, I, I can't teach that, I'm not that. <laughs> so um, I, I want to add my voice to the chorus of thanks um, and register in particular how breathtaking I found the prose. Um, so keep writing that way. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, my question will not surprise you. It's about the use of all that TV footage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. experience. But it, um, my, I, I, I've been looking at the Aussie Ruby show from a little bit later on. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I find the presence of them in that footage to be extremely moving. Yeah. Um, but it does make me want to ask about the conception of publics for this work. Right. And I think one of the, the things that happens in the focus on um, the thickness of the avant-garde text mm -hmm. and even on the collective nature of the undertaking um, is that questions about the publicness of the work right, at right. Demand. So, anything? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you so much for that. Um, there was, uh, I've, I've thought about, uh, thought about that in, in the, um, do you remember the, uh, the PBS documentary series, I'll Make Me a World? Mm -hmm. Right, so there's, there's a, there, I think it was probably episode five or six, where there's an interview with Spike Lee that sometime between Maybe it's right around the time school days is around the, uh, getting ready to drop. And the interviewer asks uh, Spike Lee, uh, so what kind of, what, you know, what are your aspirations, <laughs> right? And, and Spike Lee's first response is, I don't want my shit to only play in museums, yeah. right? So fast forward to uh, last year when Arthur Jaffa's Dreams Are Colder Than Death yeah. is playing at Gavin Brown in Harlem, and then it goes on to LA. I mean, 
I guess what I'm getting at is that there's a presumption that these spaces are so exclusive that the, uh, that the audience for which they are perhaps, who might be most inspired by this work, may not come to those spaces. I think that that has changed radically. Mm -hmm. um, that the exclusionary ways that the museums and other curator curatorial spaces have operated has changed. Yet I'm finding more of this work being screened in a, in a museum or, or curatorial context. Um, and I'm also finding the, the, the audience is radically different yeah. uh, than, you know, not to knock, uh, you know, something like the anthology, but there, you know, I've definitely noticed <laughs> that the makeup of anthology has changed a shitload since when I started going there in the 90s, right? Um, and that has a lot to do with, you know, like the Tavia Gary's piece, uh, an ecstatic experience, I mean, the Whitney bought it, and it's now a part of their current protest exhibit, which is getting ready to end. Um, and I'm also really fascinated by the way that, you know, Arthur Joffa's work continues to circulate, and particularly Kevin Everson and Khalil Joseph and, and, and several others. So um, I think that what's happening, you know, that there's a presumption that the form might not be accessible, but I, I, I think that's just more of an elitism at this point. Uh, I mean, the work resonates across so many different audiences with various, varied backgrounds. Right? So. I'm going to come to Greg and then to Richard, but I just want to make a quick note that um, maybe during the uh, wrap up during, uh, at the end, to piggyback on what Amy was saying, maybe each of the plenaries could consider uh, how you approach uh, scholarship in terms of both politics and publics, and maybe that's something that we could talk about a little bit as one of the potential deaths of film theory, right? It's one of the deaths that it moves into a kind of public or political domain. So it might be something we could possibly address during the wrap-up. Well, Michael, I'm pretty blown away. Um, but I'd like to come to the question of the archive of Black Death as you introduced it here and as you disturbed us into having to think about it. Um, so does the archive of Black Death have any boundary? Um, or is it in some way all encompassing? Um, the remediations and remixings often here take us out into realms where Black Death is both literal and then Black Death is part of a larger sort of cultural climate. Yeah. Um, and that's all very, that's, that's really disturbing. So I wanna ask you to talk a little bit about the borders of Black Death and the relationship of that to the question of the archive. I also just wanna comment that as a literature scholar, um, Forcing us to think about the archive of Black Death takes us back to looking especially at African American literature in, in different ways. And to think about um, whether it's Beloved or um, Sing Unburied Sing. I don't know if you've read Jasmine West's newest novel, you know, in which the undead are with us all the time. Um, and they belong to an archive of black death that Ward won't let us forget or to set aside. She wants that archive to be there in a, in a popular way, I think, uh, and not just in a, in a museum. Um, thanks for the question um, and the prompt. So I guess the, 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 the first thing that kind of comes to mind is as a way of kind of speaking to, your, to, to what you're asking. You know, I'm deeply, uh, uh, the, one of the things that I've had to constantly say in the classroom to my students is, uh, you know, they wanna talk about uh, this kind of black death virality, right, uh, in, in terms of the videos and, and, and such. And the thing that they, that I usually have to, they're, they're, they're deeply horrified, uh, they're disturbed, and then I just stand in the middle of the classroom and, and, and try to impress upon them that the only thing that has changed is that we have images, right? 
Um, and, and, and that for me is kind of the most important thing to kind of take away from these videos, is that uh, we can't look at, we, first of all, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm very much in, in kind of Jatavi, of a Jatavia's opinion of, I don't really want to watch this. Uh, but I also don't want it to become overdetermined so much that people believe that it's not just a core value of America, right? Um, and so that, to me, becomes a part of, it's not even, a, it's, while I, I sometimes, I straddle the line between thinking of it as, as an archive, I also just think of it as, as just the everyday ways of America. 